Welcome guys. Today we have our panel from a diverse group and we're celebrating Independence Day and looking at where we are and where we wish to be. So I would let our panel introduce themselves. Hi John, Mike Simpson, uh, founder of Capital Rebirth, nonprofit in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Good afternoon, my name is Anna White and I work as a program director for a transitional housing program for individuals with um, mental health diagnoses. Um, I also run a consulting firm, Way With Words Consulting, LLC. Hi, I'm Natasha. Um, I work at Silver Lining Health and Wellness with Dr. Majid. Good afternoon, I'm Lance Corporal Ushery. I work for the United States Marine Corps as a amphibious assault vehicle operator. I'm just here to talk in the discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much for your service. Of course, thank you. All right. So our main goal is in today's America, where we are and where do we wish we go? So at current time, it feels that the division has increased to a record point. So that is our goal to discuss and hear from our panelists, their thoughts. And also we want to hear your thoughts and please write down in the comments, what do you think, where we are and where do we need to go and what are the steps that need to be taken? So let me ask you guys. Just where we are and where, uh -huh. where we wish to go? Yes. Okay. That's the so loaded one. Um, I think we're in a really interesting piece of history right now, um, especially as it looks at um, understanding our history, accountability for our history, and what pieces we are willing to leave behind, what pieces we're willing to take a second look at, and what pieces we're really willing to redesign altogether. So we're at a very intricate and critical role in a space that older generations um, are kind of transitioning and the younger generation is really taking full ownership of what it is that they want their America to look like. So we are in a very um, interesting and impactful, intense space because there's so many moving pieces of us trying to figure out what we want this new America to look like and what pieces of traditional America um, we're willing to um, have a hand in taking with us. Mm -hmm. So you are viewing a transition and the status quo or the past is not as um, satisfactory that we need to change. Yeah, I mean, I think we're taking a really good look at traditional values and progressive action and us trying to understand what pieces that have made America what it is um, are substantial and feel good and fair and free for everyone and what pieces of our history um, are hurtful and painful and have been a deterrent in everyone's dream being realized. So what pieces we're choosing to take from that has been interesting um, to try to navigate for all of us as Americans and specifically for my minority Americans trying to advocate for spaces and time that we do not wish to <laughs> have transitioned with us moving forward. I definitely agree with what um, Anna said. Um, and I, I think it's really, um, it's definitely a time of opinion too. A lot of people are, are expressing their opinions. It's great, but it's sometimes <laughs> has its moments <laughs> um, <clears throat> where some people are speaking up, um, may not have all the facts. A lot of people aren't getting along because of these opinions, which um, I feel like definitely, it makes America, it's a mixed pot. Um, so it's not a good nor a bad thing, but right and, now people are definitely expressing themselves. And, I, and to this point of, um, other people might not have all the facts together. I think different people are going to hear that differently. In a way, I, I think the problem is everybody is feeling stuck in a way. Mm -hmm. 
the whole nation is feeling stuck and is saying what my side is saying is true and other side doesn't have facts mm-hmm. i think a, a big factor from the way i see it is the media mm-hmm. it's there's so many different mm-hmm. the news you watch like there's so many either far right news stations far left or just opinion opinionated like you guys have said that portray different perspectives of the situations that are happening in America and i think sometimes based on what people watch has an effect on how they view what's going on right now in the world because absolutely exactly not so, much, not so much of america's problem but it's a very much an international problem because everyone's seeing it like people overseas in hong kong in places like that in a way rather than media bringing people together what makes news is conflict and in a way even when they are bringing people to get their channel viewing they are increasing the conflict or the conflict points to get the best rating the focus on bringing together has somehow been missed everybody just proving that i'm right yes i feel that the media um and the news is no longer actually news um it's more of entertainment and that's just coming from a communication standpoint and what they i've actually been told in communication studies um earning a degree um at Penn State Harrisburg so um i don't know that's just what they they say nowadays and it's, it's sad um and it's hard because it's supposed to be the news is supposed to be a check and balance um it's supposed to check us on what's actually really happening um behind the scenes and that's not what we're getting anymore so the comment on that natasha had a situation um at a restaurant across the river um a couple weeks back um and that was a narrative that abc 27 put out uh they did a full interview with me nobody else was included and yet they name and they know my organization is named Capital Rebirth but instead their headline for clickbait was uh Black Lives Matters protesters uh show up in June team uh June team shirts uh and then they had a picture of a black man with braids and tattoos on his neck yelling in for at a off uh police officers and that's not what I stand for that's not what my organization stand for so it kind of made us look bad and you know it took them a few hours uh after I reached out as soon as I seen I reached out so I'm changed the name changed the picture and it took a few hours for them to actually you know get on it and change the story um but like I said we we understand that's what the media wants they want controversy because that's for sales i uh, know twist your words they'll twist your story they'll twist your organization and you know tie it to a whole different movement that's not you know what's not even part we support black lives matter but that's not us. We weren't protesting that day. We were just coming to get a meal. There's a big difference and you know when you do an exclusive interview with me, there should be a picture that reflects me that is of me. But instead, you have it looking controversial where a black man is arguing uh with a police officer with the stereotype braids and tattoos. So it's just, you know, negative all around. So it was clickbait. So, you know, that's just the way the media works. Mhm. Unfortunate. Uh, at personal level have you do you guys feel there is a lot of hate in america right now yeah i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but for the first time i think that with the birth of social networks and media it's being exposed like those individuals are exposing themselves and now they're not hiding like you said earlier people are you know making the headlines for these type of things cuz they're being recorded you know and, and they're actually typing up, you know, comments and status and they're getting themselves fired and in deep trouble. Um so I think it's just being more exposed because uh like you said before the media controlled all the outlets. Now if something happens down the street, I can pull my phone out, record it, and now it's viral worldwide, you know, to show more evidence that the news probably won't cover. Mm. What are your thoughts trend and uh, Natasha about aid in America? Um yeah, I definitely personally feel there's too much hate in America. It actually hurts my heart. Some of the I know that we're talking about media as well right now and that just goes to play. Some of the videos and things that I've seen just broke my heart and I just 
it makes me really sad and it makes me want to do whatever I can to help things change and help people unite instead of hurt each other because okay. that's not what America is. Mm-hmm. For me, uh-huh. for me, it makes me uneasy too because, you know, I come from a, a Marine Corps where it's like you're a Marine. It's not, you're not based off a of color. Mm-hmm. There's really isn't really a stereotype. You're just all one. You're brothers and sisters, you know, so you all love each other. And, you know, you have your days where you get angry. But at the end of the day, you still joke around and get along. And I feel like America doesn't see enough of that because of things like the media, social media, people's personal interactions and their stories. So the things that I see, it makes me feel like obviously something needs to change. What do you guys think would change this hit in your opinion? That's where things get a little tricky because <laughs> the media gets in the way so much and people are so opinionated, which again is a great thing, but it's, it's, um, I don't know. I just, you can't trust the media nowadays, all media. Um, I do like, there are some real journalists you hear about here and there. Um, but that really has such a big play in what people are willing to believe in, um, and what they believe. Uh, so I, I feel like that's where it's really hard to, figure out how to change that. Um, And there's also a lot of these like broadcasting networks, they're biased depending on who pays them and who pays them like the most. Yeah, uh, the change just needs to be like all through, (laughs) all through all parts of not only the government, but media. I feel like we kind of just need a refresher, but like again, how do you do that? (laughs) Right. And I think, I think to the point though, the way to do that is through dialogue. So we obviously have a gift and curse of social media and people being able to give too much opinion, right? But I think that there's a lot to be said by the power of people being able to give an opinion, right? Because now we do see advocacy from specifically the dominant culture in a way that we haven't seen before. And we see that through social media and through them being able to express you know, themselves and also the level of advocacy that's coming from individuals who feel that they have been oppressed or haven't had the the best treatment in this country, right? So I think that um, to Trent's point though, creating spaces um, that have a lot of the components and values of um, the military, right? Like respect, honor, integrity. Those are very isolated spaces, right? Where your life and your regard for me will make or break what happens here, right? Our solidarity is necessary. And we don't have that outside of military, right? We also just have instances in the military that unfortunately have shown that even with the integrity piece intact, that there's still spaces for a little bit of progressive change even in those spaces, right? So there is never going to be a perfect space where we can all exist and have the same opinion. But I think that to Trent's point, there are some qualities that I think will make us a better nation. And it comes with integrity and honoring each other and respecting each other and understanding that if one man suffers in the group, that we all suffer, that one man's pain is relative to our own pain, right? So those I think um, are the pieces that, because I have military friends as well, that really is frustrating, right? (laughs) About trying to fight for a country that still has so much work to do when the individuals that are fighting seem to be very clear on the values that are necessary um, to move forward, right? So there's never gonna be a perfect space. I think dialogue is important. And I think being able to express yourself factually and also with um, a sense of good intention is really what has been the difference in a lot of what's been happening. And uh, just to go on that, 
I actually watched a documentary this morning by uh, Chelsea Handler. It's called uh, Hello Privilege on Netflix. Um, I encourage anybody to watch that, whether you're white, black, Puerto Rican, it doesn't matter, watch it. I'm going to give you a great understanding of what white privilege is because, you know, I think that's a big thing too where people don't believe that exists or they base it off of money. Oh, well, you know, I'm a white person. I'm poor. It's not about that. It's just the stereotypes that have been put in the media, the history behind, you know, the way blacks were viewed and treated. It's a mentality driven stereotype in everybody's head the first moment they look at a white person, the moment they look at a black person. Um, but I think the biggest solution, um, I think we need to put more funding into our um, education systems of minority, give those more opportunities. Because when you look at the school system, the funding is based off of a test, a test. So if my school score is higher on this test, uh, I get more money, but I already have the resources. I already have everything I need for these kids to be successful. But yet these kids over here who are struggling, who come to school, who don't even eat, who have been traumatized, you know, at the age of three, four, five from hearing gunshots every night or seeing people that they know gunned down or, you know, having to be told that story at six, that, hey, your dad has just been killed or your dad's going to jail for drugs because he was trying to provide for his family. Because most drug dealers in the city don't have, or just drug dealers in general, they don't have bad intent. They feel like they don't have no option. And they get arrested at, you know, into the system at 12, 13 years old when they're trying to find themselves and then they're trapped in that system and they can't never get out. They can't never, you know, possibly get an even chance at getting a job. Um, so I think we need to flip the way funding and some of the resources are to, you know, give these, uh, you know, less unfortunate poverty areas, which struck in more minorities than anything, um, especially Spanish and Blacks, uh, just the chance and opportunities to have a playing field. And, um, on that's a great point. Also, another uh, documentary on Netflix is uh, 13th. Watch mm. that as well. And I think it, they also put that on the YouTube now. Um, so that's another one to understand some of that historical trauma. How can people stop here? Particularly, can people stand up to the person in their group? It's easy to point to the other party and say like they're, they're spreading hate or they're doing it. Can people stand up to their own group leader or members who are misusing First Amendment to spread hate? Well, I just had this conversation, I think yesterday about how hard it is for individuals that are recently committing themselves towards advocacy that are non people of color and how difficult it is because we're talking about dismantling systems and what we do know is that if you are operating under dominant culture then that usually is you know straight white male but they have a wife right so if this counterpart and they have daughters and sons and whoever's and if those individuals now newly subscribe to say hey you know what let's take a second look at how we're doing things at a, at a systemic level. We know that those individuals that are running those groups are the wives, the sisters, the sons of this family dynamic. So coming home as, you know, whoever and saying, you know what, I, I have been learning a lot about this. I really feel like this is something we need to take seriously. You know, hey, hey uncle, whoever, hey dad, what are some ways that your, your organization can, can help in this cause? A lot of individuals are finding resistance at the family table now when they're like, you know, oh, they don't deserve blah, 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 or whatever the conversation is. I think people are having a really hard time because they're discovering how deep things are and how much things have gotten out of hand. And when trying to dismantle it, it's not enough to say, oh, we're just going to change some symbols. We're just going to change some things. If it's really rooted in housing development and uh, medical facilities and in all of these different spaces, schooling, then it's it's going to take having those tough conversations with the individuals that are at the head of it. And what's been difficult that I've heard in my conversations with people is that people are making really, really strong life decisions, like getting divorces, um, not speaking to their friends and family, um, 
re regrouping on how they want to um, educate their children. Like there's some very tough decisions that are happening because the reality is you have to use your advocacy if you're in a dominant culture in your space. So it's not enough to come to rallies and Black Lives Matter things and all things minority, right? We're clear on what's happening. We know <laughs> that the systemic change has to happen from the top to the bottom, but it's the people that are having to navigate that world who are at in that world that is harder to do and frightening for some people because you have to face the individuals in your space, in your culture that have perpetually caused this systemic madness that we call racism and prejudice. Absolutely. And having that discussion more start at, because we all only control our behavior or what we do, that's what we teach kids. So if we start from ourselves, everybody would have more power. And does hate, does hate help any group, even majority group? Does it help? I think in some cases it could, not necessarily in a negative way, but a positive way, because, you know, if people hate the way others are being treated, obviously that hate can be put to a very positive use and change the way they want the other group to change, you know? Mm -hmm. So, like, for example, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, like, obviously people hate to see it, so they're going to take that hate and they're going to use it positively and make it like I saw the other day, almost 2 million people signed a position, petition to change something, obviously because of the way they didn't like it. And I think obviously I was driven by hate because they don't like to see it. So it made a positive change. Uh, I think it had something to do with like the police, honestly, because, you know, a bunch of people weren't agreeing with it. Like someone was treated poorly. So they put out a position saying like, oh, this needs to change. Like we're tired of seeing this. This isn't good. All that. So like over 2 million people signed it and then it got up to the, the head person in charge and they actually went and went through with the change. Wow. Uh, with the Black Lives Matter what are your thoughts on that, Natasha? It's a it's a tough one because, <laughs> like, obviously I agree, um, and I have you know, um, trans my little brother. Um, I've come from a mixed background. I have all sorts of different friends. <laughs> Doesn't matter who you are, and that's kind of always how I've been, how I've thought. Um, so I definitely think we need, things need to change um, in terms of. Uh, the, the police system and um, fixing that whole issue of, um, you know, police brutality. Um, that shouldn't happen no matter who you are, but um, the fact that it happens to, um, the fact that it happens because of any race terms is just outrageous to me and that obviously needs to be changed. So, um, that's how I feel. I'm supportive of it. If we're gonna get some change in the in the police system and get some actual um, good a good police force that not only wants to protect the community but actually cares for others and knows their rights, their responsibilities. Um, and I think we should be more selective when choosing who becomes a police officer. Personally. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely for Black Lives Matter. Um, I'm with you got like with everyone with for that. Like mm -hmm. that's a very good movement, and I do see it like going places. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just don't like the uh, um, how the media again how the media portrays a lot of it, um, and to the extremes of separating Black Lives Matter and that Antifa group. Um, I think that's important, <laughs> um, trying to figure out the differences between those two groups and what's going on there. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my take. So just to touch on uh, the police, I just know uh, in the city of Harrisburg, just my opinion and just 
people interaction, period. We need to start seeing these officers on the street. You know, most times I ride or I see the cops, they're at a gas station or empty parking lot, or they're already in action arresting somebody. But they don't take the time, or enough of them don't take the time to park their car somewhere and just walk around the neighborhood, get to know people. People may not speak to you the first week or two, but you know, time goes on, you'll they'll see that officer more and more in that community, interact with some of the kids, talk to the residents, you know, get a better understanding of people. So therefore, if something does happen, you know, in that area, you know that person. So you know, okay, I, I'm not going to feel threatened. This is Tyrone down the street. You know, I'm not going to feel threatened. This is Jessica. Okay, I know she has mental health issues. We've had these conversations. Let me get, you know, her the right treatment. We don't need to take her to jail. You know, it's like you need to get into your community to have some type of understanding. But if you just come in there and you ride your car, you are sitting in empty parking lots or gas stations, how are you getting to know the community to even police the community? And I think so much of Black Lives Matter, and maybe this is the media, is just simply thought of to be about police reform, right? But what what people are fighting for is direct human rights, right? So I think people are missing the point when it comes to that. Like certainly the biggest one is police reform, but we were guaranteed civil rights that have yet to be enacted. So at this point, we're just fighting for human rights first. And then maybe we can get back to being civil in those civil rights acts, right? So I think that naming it Black Lives Matter and saying, oh, that's just, that's just about the police. It turns it into a political issue where if you have a police officer or believe in law enforcement, then you're anti-Black Lives Matter. But the movement is really about how are we understanding what we have done since the civil rights movement? Where have we fallen short? Do we have humane rights for African Americans? Do we have that? Have we accomplished that? And so much of it just gets encapsulated in police reform that people are like, oh, I'm not with Black Lives Matter because he took a knee and the American flag and the, the anthem. It's so much more than police reform. So I think the media does a good job of keeping it there because of course it gets sensationalized. And then if there's police occurrences as a result of it, that's sensationalized. But really what the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement is, is about have we done our due diligence to provide human rights to African-Americans? And where have we fallen short in that? So then when you hear, well, all lives matter, we're like, I hear that. And I, I just wish that all lives mattered between that time period when it was very clear that all lives did not right there's very clear evidence that we picked up this motto but have not believed in it for quite a while so that's where i think the black lives versus all lives matter things comes into play because it's insulting i think to some to hear well all lives matter well we have evidence of the contrary and that's why we want to say we need to focus on how black lives matter and make sure that we feel the effects of our lives mattering in the way that you all have felt that your lives have mattered as well. So it's all about wording and the the scope of what people are choosing to focus on, for sure. Yeah. I was actually um, reading Declaration of Independence in today's light. And it's a beautiful document. Everybody should read it. And uh, it feels different. And, today's context um, I think that just those couple of lines we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among these are life liberty and pursuit of happiness so when we are talking about the right of life being taken away or, or the, 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 the whole commentary about the justice is beautiful in this document. And, and I think in reality, both sides um, need to come together to the original documents and the constitution and the declaration of independence that these from the founding fathers have been well thought out. And can I just say one more thing? I don't mean to uh -huh. over talk, but 
we oftentimes start to think that when we have an issue with American uh, values or how they've been displayed that African Americans or minorities are being anti-patriotic, right? But I just think to myself, like, we are very clear on the history of how we got here. We're very clear on the history of our significant contributions to America. So if people start to look at it, not as individuals being anti-America, but I love this country as well. I have blood, sweat, and equity into this country as well. So I think it's the love of country that is coming through in the frustration of what we're calling hate. So when you were saying like, you know, can hate be cured? I oftentimes see frustration. I don't know that I see hate. I see anger because there's there's nothing more frustrating than building something. <laughs> like building something and then being dismissed from it so it's frustration and it's anger that i see way more than than hate i think that the hate part might come into i'm so determined to keep you there in this space that you're trying to get out of and what that looks like and how that is administered right so i think that frustration in the media looks like hate yelling arguing cussing all that looks like hate all that looks like just negativity and evil but if you get to the heart of it i think it's our love for the country the country that we all have a stake in that we have all built and maintained that a lot of us feel like we're being written out of or dismissed from or denied access to in a way that has been promised to us by way of the Declaration of Independence, by way of civil rights acts, by way of all of these things that we fought for, it's almost like I wish more people would imagine what it's like to be a person of color that has built a country, right? And that's not to take away from white contribution, but it's to very clearly say, we're clear on what happened, right? And we're clear on ways in which our culture is still being utilized for the good of the whole, but there's no claiming us, there's no respecting us. So I think that if we start to look at it from a place of hurt and frustration, rather than us saying we hate this country because it's not X, Y, and Z, I think it's the opposite. I think if we didn't care about the country, we wouldn't say anything about it. We'd go on about our business and figure out how to get out of here. But it's because we love this country and we want to be here correctly and maintained and handled correctly, that we're fighting to make sure that our children see America for what was promised to us, instead of how we are executing on that promise. So while we're on the 4th of July and the Declaration of Independence, uh, the founder of the university I actually attended in college, University of Virginia, the founder is Thomas Jefferson. Um, and that was wrote in 1776, right? During that time, there was still slavery, but he was preaching in the uh, declaration that it was equality, it was justice for all, it was equal playing field, but it clearly wasn't. So that's where the whole blacks, you know, we start celebrating our freedom as June 19, 1865. People just think that, oh, you know, last year, or within the last two years, we just made up some new holiday and we just want to celebrate. We want to crash, you know, the 4th of July party and we're anti-American. And no, this is our history, which came later after you wrote the Declaration of Independence. So clearly directly, the Declaration of Independence was made up of lies because you were still owning slaves at that time. So how can we honor and respect that? And that type of stuff wasn't really taught or exposed to us in school. But now, like I said, with the birth of technology, we are eager to figure out what was really happening. And a lot of these are facts and they can be found on any resource, in books, however you want to discover your knowledge, it's proven facts. So that's where, you know, the whole disadvantage comes. That's where everything pretty much started, where we still haven't caught up at all. You said it was going to be fair when I mean, you wrote this in 1776, but yet in 18, uh, 1865, we were free, but were we re really free? Because we weren't allowed to vote. They did this whole segregation and Jim Crow and all this police. So are we really free? So that's where 
people are starting to, you know, push away from selling the fourth, uh, celebrating the Fourth of July, and put more focus on June nineteenth as the Black Society. And on Natasha. Um, no, that's. I mean, that's awesome. Both of what you guys both just said. Um, definitely in agreement. In agreement with both um, of those comments. Um, and I actually opened my eyes to, I I didn't know people were celebrating that. So that's awesome. Um, and that's really cool. And I'm happy that I learned something about that because that's really interesting. And same thing right. about, I didn't know people signed the petition that Trent was talking about. Just a lot of eye openers <laughs> yeah. today. I learned a lot personally. Awesome. I actually have to agree with Natasha because of what Mr. Simpson said and what Miss White said, you know, I didn't know, because like obviously now that you know this, I've never learned that. And that puts me into a different perspective now that I've heard this information. Because the media will make you think that we just did it right now because we're really mad about July 4th, right? So we just threw something together. Um, but really it's us going back to, let's start mm -hmm. celebrating more of our things because they're left out and let's get back to being more centralized in our history because it's not it's nowhere to be found so just like we were always doing kwanzaa we were always doing juneteenth but this year specifically because we feel so strongly about our freedoms we are just standing down on what how how america chooses to celebrate its freedom right so and i think it's good that again that's why dialogue is important so you never knew that and would have never known that had those conversations had this conversation not happened power of dialogue is there are two final questions one is the do people who provoke hate in their group are they actually sincere to their own group does hate help their own group members um this could be a tricky response but <laughs> uh sometimes yes so if you know, you have a bunch of white political figures or white, you know, judges and lawyers that are going to benefit off of sending minorities to jail, per se, and you're making, you know, money off of how many kids you send to jail and percentages from these lawyers and side deals. So if I continue to, you know, put this hate in myself against, you know, black people, when I see them in my courtroom and the judges, you know, portray that whole black stereotype mentality, yes i want to keep that hate going then because i'm making money and a lot of times money is the root of all evil and that's what a lot of this stems from like recently there were two judges uh you know uh in harrisburg that are dealing with some situations right now legally which they done and it's coming back to bite them because they had this prejudice hate against certain types of individuals and they utilized that in court and made more money off of it um you know so you know you read what you sow but like that's where the game is played dirty at so right, I hear your point, but I, I would say that's also short-sighted view on their part, because in the end, money is not going to buy long-term pursuit of happiness. After a certain point, money doesn't buy us any happiness. The other thing is, if we look at our ourselves as a nation or as a even the world in one boat, if people are fighting or hating each other, in the end, it's uh, at a larger scale, everybody's gonna drown together. In the short side, I, somebody might make more kind of political gain or win the election or win more money. But in the long term, they're, they're, what do we, when we are earning money or we are doing all those gains, we are working on making the planet hope, hopefully better for the future generation, but that's gonna hurt the future generation. But while you say that to add on, um, that I left out, it's they wanna continue to have their next person replace them same level so like they can maintain that dominance and don't allow, you know, minorities to creep into these positions where change can actually happen, you know, on different boards, you know, as members. Uh, you know, allowing them to own NFL teams, which, you know, pretty much dominates the market and dominates a lot of views with people. Uh, like they, we, they don't allow 
minorities to get into such high positions that they actually can force change. Uh, you know, so that's kind of where that dominance continues to happen until, you know, they start to come to our side, understand, have these type of conversations and start to be fair and equal across the board. It's going to be tough for minorities to, to actually get changed. And, and right, and I think on the same, on uh, also for the same point, for the bigger benefit, let's say NFL or any team, they would benefit in in long sight or long sight. They would benefit from getting the best player in the team rather than favorite. It's 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 not just the player; it's the owners. Those yeah. are the ones who control the NFL. There are no black NFL owners, but the league is like eighty six percent blacks. So you're making a lot of money, but you won't allow the, off the field, but you won't allow them to actually profit after after and have some type of input. Like example, when I play at the University of Virginia, there would be people in the stands that are white. I would see them with my jersey on in the student section, but I would see them on campus and I would say, hey, how you doing? And they would look at me and it was a whole different, you know, interaction. They didn't even want to acknowledge me. But while I'm on a field in a helmet scoring touchdowns for the school, it's, oh, yes, I can wear his jersey. Oh, yes, I can cheer for him. Well, respect me as the same person I am on and off the field because at the end of the day, I'm in a school just like you. I'm being educated in these same classrooms under the same structure. So I'm just as intelligent as you. So don't, you know, knock me down because of a stereotype that they have. You know, all black people are black dudes are playing football because they're unathletic. I mean, they're uneducated. They're just here because of the athletics. No, respect me the same. E- treat me as equal across the board. Valid point. Anna? You know, I think I was trying to answer your question. It's such a deep, do they benefit from the hate? I think it's about intention. If your intention is to do good, then you will create systems around you that serve that purpose. If your intention is to do harm or to belittle or to disempower, then your intentions will be seen in that also, right? So if I am a person that harbors and hate, then yes, I hate does benefit me if that's what I'm sharing with everyone, right? That's how dictators and terrorists get have an audience, right? We people have a base. So there are no outliers in this. I just feel like there are individuals who come from a space of good and people that come from a space of evil. And whether you look at it from politics, religion, whatever, however you look at it, just being human, we're fighting against forces of good and evil and intention and people's hearts. So I think if we start to take politics out of it, because politics is just simply how how we ascribe ascribe our value system, and then we call it a group of something, right? So our value systems are being challenged right now, not our political party. Um, What we have at stake as humans is being challenged right now, not, not our religious value, right? So we we're fighting against good and evil and those good and evils are portrayed in certain groups and portrayed in certain categories and labeled as things and if you start to unpack that you'll see that the greater the greater fight is against humanity Mm -hmm. and how we are establishing ourselves as human beings um from one person to the next Mm -hmm. right natasha yeah um so the whole question of hate is sometimes i feel like in groups you can't you also can't get the hate confused for passion um uh i I definitely view hate as more of a negative thing a negative energy um and i also believe in karma and what goes around comes around um so i think that Definitely there's people that are benefit from maybe benefiting from the seat, but they'll get what's coming to them kind of is how I feel <laughs> in the end. Um, because, and, and it's good to be passionate though. If you have passion and you're, you want to fight to accomplish something, that's amazing. Um, and that's an awesome quality to have. And you just can't get those two con- mixed up or confused or intertwined. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I feel about that. <laughs> I agree with that. Like, obviously, if you if you have good intentions, you hate the way something is, then you're going to use that hate and drive it and collect followers, and they're going to see the same perspective you have, and you're going to get something done. 
but obviously like if you're if you have your bad intentions and you're doing the same thing to get other people to follow your bad intentions then things are going to clash and it's not going to go so well Mm -hmm. because people love to see the good but they hate to see the hate Uh, there is a common theme in your points that uh, what what are we hearing so so what's the what's the quote from jesus you could hate the sin but not the sinner <laughs> <laughs> so i think in the end uh, it's the value or what we are, if we are trying to change something we could kind of look badly on the action but in the end for humans to um hate each other i would i would certainly i feel also that um in the short term yes it could benefit somebody some party um but in the long term it makes the whole planet unsafe it divides and the division um that if whenever it is not win win situation for any groups then if either party loses then next time the other party is going to make up for that so um we should aim in my opinion we should aim for when when but i understand your point that the in the short side people are going towards that another point for hate i feel that the person who harbors it inside or for their or teaches their kids or their family members because many people are teaching that from a young age um it in a way it just makes the world view so negative that um is bad for their mental health <laughs> the other final question i uh, and feel free to of course add your other thoughts as well but uh, how can we bring love that conquers all this division and hate and bring us together um conversations like these uh the uncomfortable one um but it has to be from a standpoint where um white people aren't necessarily asking us how they can fix it because they know you know what they need to do they need to sit talk to us understand us you know put all these stereotypes aside and actually join the fight because without you you know we're outnumbered you know without you know uh white people stepping aside some of these powerful positions and letting more minorities get in there so they can have votes in these you know outcomes whether it's court cases or you know the education system so our voices are heard you know and um like i said uh i think the uncomfortable conversations and the ones like you said you have to check your you know white friends need to check each other um you know you can't let them talk about minorities in a negative way you can't let them call them the n word or talk bad about them you know cuz they're all humans just like you um like i said we all should be treated with equality but those uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations to me i think is the start uh to even having some type of understanding to provide a solution to peggy back on that i think it has to go to change people's perspectives because you know if you're trying to change something what's the point of being negative about it there's always a positive side you need to see and you know like mr simpson said like keeping your friends in check you know like if they're saying something that's out of line you need to be like hey like you shouldn't even be thinking about that there's no reason to think or say that or do that action you know this is like i think maybe you should see it in this way and if not then like move away from that person and eventually they need to find it out for themselves or else they they'll just be alone i in a sense so talk to like talk to our own group members who are dividing or spreading hate or using negative hate. or take your group and the view that you have and try to have the same conversation with another large group of people i think and i i, I always go back to um trent because i just have a lot of military friends <laughs> and i think that one of the things that impresses me about them is that there's such a level of selflessness and sacrifice, right? And that is love. That is regard, right? To to see yourself in another person, to see their family um in another person, right? And it, that's not skin color. 
So if we can just begin by seeing ourselves in other people and knowing that if I simply treat you the way that, and it's so archaic, treat people how you want to be treated. But it's, if you do it correctly and from mm -hmm. a really good space, that's the solution. I mean, I think we water it down and tell our kids that because we're like, be nice to people. But it really comes down to people's heart and intention. I've seen groups of men from different racial groups that, that do serve. And like I said earlier, it really speaks values. And we need to get back to, or begin the process of valuing human life with the same intensity as our own, right? Be able to look at Natasha and say, if something happens to her, that is just as impactful as her looking at me and saying, I don't want anything to happen to Anna. And it has to feel genuine, right? It has to be a sense of one man's disaster in this country will can and will ruin us if we all continue to do that. It's not just like, oh, it's me and my family and we have to survive. Yes. But if you do it in a way that cripples another family, that effect, like to Natasha's point about karma, can come back and haunt you. If I steal from another man and then that person doesn't have any money left and then that person kills somebody else, I did that by stealing from the next man who then had to go kill someone in order to make ends meet because of what I did. So not enough of us are understanding how we're all connected, but it comes down to simple, the values, we learn to love people by going back to your religion, going back to your, your core and what the universe says we're supposed to be to one another so that we can all survive here. It's the same thing as global warming. People are like, well, we don't care. Your children care, right? Like, do you care about anyone else's kids after you're gone? So it's just about values and seeing yourself in other people and knowing that what you do has consequences outside of you and caring about that. And, and I think coronavirus has made that very clear to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to also include um, empathy can be such a powerful thing. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes and feeling their pain as it was yours is until you've actually felt it, you know, it's, it's really powerful. And, um, and I definitely that's if we practice more empathy, um, and more dialogue like this. Um, also, not a lot of people realize, like, you gotta listen, 85% of communication is listening, and just listening alone. Um, other, you know, percentage is, uh, is talking. 85% of communication is listening. So if we listen to each other, then we can put yourself in someone else's shoes that way. And I really feel, um, yeah, dialogue, empathy, um, and we'll spread love. And definitely that will help, help things as well. Mm -hmm. Great point. So there's a, I came across a very nice quote from uh, Clarence Jordan. It is not enough to limit your love to your own nation, to your own group. You must respond with love even to those outside of it. So this concept enables people to live together, not as nations, but as the human race. Love does um, conquer the hate and division that the more we are dividing, the more um, everybody is going to hurt, the planet is going to get unsafer, and the more we unite, and one of the biggest risks to human race is more risk of wars. Historically, wars have killed all of us. It, it, it has been lost, and if we get another one of those now with all these nuclear weapons, it's going to be catastrophic in the literal sense. So we need to love each other, understand each other, have these conversations and dialogue. And I'm so thankful to all of you for taking time today and talking. Um, Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. Yeah, this was good. Thanks. Good dialogue. Absolutely. Yes, thank, thank you, you for, everyone so much. <laughs> thank you for giving me a new perspective on things as well. Yeah.
really helps me open my eyes. And I encourage you to watch the documentary, The 13th, um, yes. and, and the other one, uh, White Privilege. Um, those are two ones that you'll open your eyes a lot more so you can see fact after fact, you know, situation after situation. So, I'm starting. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness. So hopefully we open up more conversations like this. Absolutely. And please, uh, if you like this conversation, share and uh, subscribe to the channel. Write in your comments your own thoughts because we really want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.